The desire to overcome death is nothing new. The Epic of Gilgamesh, the first recorded story of human history, accounts on clay tablets, a mythical king's quest for immortality. 4,000 years later, humans are still searching for immortality. With the modernization of healthcare, encouraged by biotechnology and computer science, remarkable gains have been made in extending human lifespans. A child born today can expect to live more than three times longer than in the time of Gilgamesh. Stem cells, caloric restriction, cryonics, nanotechnology, and transhumanism have become the watchwords of our era. Perhaps with the accumulation of these accelerating advancements, we are indeed on the verge of a complete reversal of the biological aging process, regenerative medicine in our lifetimes. And if so, if we are able to overcome aging and then live forever, what would this mean for religion? What would this mean for governments and social systems which rely on a noble and timely death? Perhaps once we've conquered aging, we'll no longer even wish to stay as vulnerable humans. Perhaps we'll expedite our progression from immortal beings into cyborgs and then to completely post-human entities. But now there are more pressing questions. What about the environment? Oppression by the wealthy over the poor? The problem of overpopulation? What about boredom? with a life that stretches out forever. And even more ominous, what if the universe were to end itself in a whimper, a long, expanding heat death into the infinite? If so, what's the point in trying to live forever anyway? While it's impossible to answer all of these questions within one documentary, we can provide a glimpse, a brief snapshot in time, from the voices of the visionaries at the forefront. Join us as we take this amazing journey, exploring Life Extension, an Immortality Institute film. of things that I want to do and I don't think I would ever get bored. Um, I really value life. I love life and I don't want it to end, ever. I don't want to put a limit on the number of years or centuries or millennia that I want to live. Um, there may come a time in my life where I don't want to live anymore, but that's not right now. Um, I, want, I don't want to have a limit. At some point, humans would be able to take care of all of our medical problems. I just never thought it would be possible in my lifetime. And now for the first time, I am seriously thinking that it could be possible in my lifetime. It really induced trance, really, where we have convinced ourselves of this absurdity that aging is actually a good thing. Um, you know, that's all it is, it's a trance. It's my job to wake people up, and the only real way to do it is to present actual factual information in other words, to develop, to do experimental work in the laboratory that, dem that shows incontrovertibly that aging can be very dramatically altered. And the oldest person in the world that we know of who has been documented by the Guinness Book of Records is named Jean Calmet, a French lady who died at the age of 122 in the year 1997. But we see now that we have tools to attack the problem, and if we fail to do so, we're going to die. And the next generation, or the next generation after that, will, will wake up and see it, you know, and they will be the benefiters. And it's, the burden is upon us, the people that know, you and I, that know, you know, we have the responsibility because we know that the, the average citizen the average population does, don't know what we know, and so they don't have that responsibility. But we need to, you know, we need to enlighten enough people to, uh, to make an effect while, while we can, so we can benefit ourselves and all the people we care about. You make it 85 or 90, you know, um, and um, you know, if we push everyone out to that level, well, let's see, you know, if I'm 48 now, you know, if I can, if I can get to 80, you know, that's another 30 years, that pushes me to 
2034. And if we don't have robust, tech, you know, really pretty robust stem cell technology, you know, even beginning nanotechnology by 2034, I would be very, very surprised. Yeah, I love to live, and uh, I want to live more, and uh, I don't think there's anything else after that. So uh, this is my motivation for working on aging research. Yes, where technology has an interface with your body, with the human body. Uh, we've got stents in our hearts. We take all these things for granted. You know, contact lenses now. Now, now we're implanting contact lenses and doing laser surgery. These, these are all things that seemed real radical at one time. Uh, like you said, you know, heart pacemakers and now artificial hearts. Uh, they just become, uh, at first, uh, big news. Uh, second, uh, something that everybody wants if they need them. And third, something that everybody takes for granted once they get them or once, they, once everybody else had them for a while. It's very frustrating that none of these super rich superheroes have decided to focus on uh, what's really of long-term importance to the human race and to intelligence on Earth, which in my view, the two most important things right now that anyone can work on are probably human life extension and artificial intelligence. Like, I, I tend to think that like this century is like the gateway century you know, by that by that I mean like we will either destroy ourselves this century or we will attain immortality it's the rational part of my mind against the part of my mind that truly wants to believe in an afterlife to know that if there's nothing afterwards what does that mean for me and it makes it worth that that doubt makes it worth doing everything I can to make sure that that I and others who are unsure have an opportunity to live as long as possible. And if we can live just enough, just make it long enough, I believe that technology will advance enough to where some few lucky of us will never have to die. It's not a matter of whether there will never be life extension, because I don't think that they're ever going to be able to, to bid life extension. It's a matter of how aggressively we pursue it. And, and I think Nick Bostrom's recent fable uh, of the dragon you know, puts this very clearly. Uh, if you see that there will be a time when negligible senescence or, or completely delayed aging is possible, and you see a time when all the diseases that kill people today can be cured, then it's not a matter of uh, you know, that this ne future is never going to get here, it's that all these people are going to die unnecessarily. If we could get it 20 years sooner, all these people would be saved. You have to raise the legitimacy. We, we had done over 10 or 15 years, had brought up homosexuality and made it a legitimate issue for discussion. And I think that's what's going on now with, it, with the immortality issue, is that here and there, they're, they're getting coherent people or people of increasing stature coming out and saying, why not? You know, why shouldn't we try to have at least extreme life extension, which would create less. Somehow when you say immortality, remember that the Greek gods were called the immortals. So in a way, when you start saying that you're an immortalist, it's almost like, once again, in the interest of saying, you know, you're a god. You're claiming to be god. You know, wow. I mean, talk about blasphemy big time mainstream phraseology of life extension and, and life extension is a mainstreamable version of immortality. Immortality is just not polite in mixed company to, to use that word because it evokes to people either um, anti-godliness or um, it evokes to people a kind of a uh, bravado of, of um, or ubris that one you know thinks that they are a god. Um, in fact, in my experience, the immortalists don't think of themselves as gods at all. They think of themselves as, as mere mortals that want to enjoy uh, learning and loving forever. And uh, that's, that's all I think immortalists see in the word immortality. They don't get into all the other definitions. If you ask a medical professional now, when is someone dead? They will say, well, no pulse, no respiration, no brain activity. Then you say, but you resuscitate people from that condition all the time, don't you? Well, yes, we do. Well, then they couldn't have been dead. Well, no, they weren't because they weren't pronounced legally dead. So it's just a legal fiction as far as I'm concerned.